how can Christians effectively respond to abortion culture? Hey, Poster Jen, I'm Kristen Hawkins. Welcome to this new episode of the Explicitly Pro-Life Podcast. Listen, a post row America is coming, and we as a pro-life generation recognize now more than ever, pro-life voices are needed to cut through all the noise, to be a voice for the voiceless, to stand for truth and life. We are the new Students for Life contributors, and we're bringing you exclusive and original content. I'm Autumn Higashi, your host of Unapologetic, I'm here to help you break down the pro-abortion narrative so you know how to defend what you believe in with truth and love. I'm Christine Jurgen, your host of the new show, Speak Out. I'm looking forward to bringing you interviews with the biggest names out there who are bold enough to stand for life. I'm Kongman Lee, your host of Man Up. I'm looking forward to bringing you the pro-life position from a man's perspective and satire exposing the absurdity of pro-abortion logic. Consider us another tool in your pro-life arsenal to prepare for a post-road generation. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. You won't want to miss this. You know, the Bible is very clear on the murder of the innocent. And it's so important to God that the innocent be protected, that he put it in the Ten Commandments. Thou shall not kill. Yet, the tragic reality of sin is that we live in a culture where killing the innocent is pervasive through abortion. So how do we, as Christian believers, reconcile these two realities? Our faith gives us some tangible ways to help heal the brokenness of abortion. We can help promote a culture of life by letting women and families know how much they are loved and how precious their lives are. We can help women and men heal from abortion by letting them know about God's mercy. Today's guest has considered these questions for many years, and I'm honored she's joined us today to uh, impart some wisdom and teach us what she's learned. June Hunt is the founder and chief servant officer of Hope for the Heart and the Hope Center. She's one of the world's leading biblical counselors whose life work has yielded landmark contributions in her field. This author, singer, speaker, built the Hope Center, a one-of-a-kind, three-story, lodge-like home for 60-plus Christian ministries to increase synergy, financial stewardship, and global expansion. After years of teaching and research, June developed 100-plus topical keys for living, providing definitions, characteristics, causes, solutions on subjects ranging from anger, abuse, and addictions to apologetics, parenting, and suicide. Her radio program is heard on hundreds of radio outlets around the world, Hope in the Night. June's live call-in counseling program actually received the 2020 Radio Impact Award by the National Religious Broadcasters and the 2021 Hall of Fame Award. She's a top-selling author with sales of over 2 million books, and she's written on a variety of topics, uh, including some of her book titles are The Answer to Anger, The Biblical Counseling Reference Guide, Bonding with Your Teen Through Boundaries, The Highly Practical, Caring for a Loved One with Cancer, um, Counseling through your Bible handbook, how to deal with difficult relationships. There's so many. She's also an accomplished musician with five vocal CDs. I didn't know this about June. I've known her for a while, but I did not know this. She was a soloist for the Billy Graham Crusades. Uh, was a soloist at the USO and has appeared on the Today Show. She's also a popular guest lecturer at colleges and seminaries across the country. You can find her on Facebook, June Hunt Hope, or follow her on Twitter, June Hope, Hunt Hope. June, thank you so much for coming on today. It's such an honor to have you with me. I'm just delighted to be with you. I so support what you're about. When I first began to hear uh, about your ministry, I was very mm-hmm. excited and thrilled uh, at the impact you were making. Well, it's it's an honor to have somebody of your wisdom uh, on the on the podcast because I often feel. Um, you know, very ill-equipped when, you know, I don't have a theology degree uh, uh, discussing um, issues about, you know, abortion and the Bible, abortion and Christian faith. Um, but before I get to the hard questions, I, I want to start off with the easy one of, you know, why is this issue of abortion personally significant to you? Why 
do you always tie God into the conversation when you discuss abortion? Well, to, to answer the question, I'd like to tell you a true story. In my mid-20s, uh, I was a, a youth director, then later a college uh, and career director. Um, I was interviewed by a popular magazine. It's a newspaper magazine called Parade Magazine. And uh, I was asked just a slew of questions. Mm -hmm. And a Christian, Kristen, one of those questions was, um, what do you believe about abortion? I don't mm. remember the exact question, but it was abortion. Well, at the time, abortion really was not a major discussion, um, uh, almost yeah. a lot like it is today. Uh, and um, I had done a word search. I, by the way, I was not raised a Christian. I, 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 not only that, I was not raised with the Bible, so I didn't know what the Bible said. And then after becoming a Christian, I was stunned, and I, I did a word search on the word abortion. Well, it wasn't in the Bible. So mm -hmm. I thought God's word had no word about the Bible, uh, about abortion. And so my answer to the question was, Abortion, I believe, is just a personal decision each woman should make based on what she thinks is best. I'm very logical, very rational. That seems logical. Well, as a result of this article, um, I received about over, I know, over 300 letters, and all just were so complimentary. Um, but there were five that requested that would I reconsider my position, my answer in regard to abortion? I read the first one. They were all very respectful letters to me. The third letter was the only one that had a scripture. Hmm. In there, it said, this is um, Jer Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This is God speaking. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, no. Oh, oh, no, I'm wrong. Before I formed you in the womb, I reread it. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. So God has a plan. He, he's a designer, and he has a mm -hmm. plan even before conception. That was stunning to me. So I wrote all five of those who had asked me, would I reconsider my position? I said, you were right. I, I was wrong. Now I realize it's the Lord that forms us in the womb and even has a plan for us as pre-born babies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being willing, for caring enough to confront me. Mm. See, I needed wisdom. I did not have wisdom on this issue at all. I didn't, I just didn't know about the sanctity of life as I then learned. And this is your forte. This is one of the things you're doing at your ministry. And then I saw how God, from God's point of view, he mm -hmm. has a plan. He has a plan for each life. And then I wrote what we call our keys, keys for living uh, on the topic of the abortion dilemma. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just going to say one other thing that happened shortly after that all took place, mm -hmm. uh, a young woman contacted me. Uh, she was a rebel. Uh, she was on drugs, single, pregnant, and mm -hmm. she was stiff arming her mother, who was a, a counselor, very biblical. And her father was an expert in Greek. He had, was teaching at a seminary. Um, but there was just this pushback. And so I had our new keys for living, um, our keys on abortion. And I went through different parts of the keys for her. And then I, but she was determined already that she was, and, and she had told her mm -hmm. mother and, and others that she was going to get an abortion. 
Mm. And then the next day I got a call from her mom. She said, I want you to know after your conversation with Audrey, um, she read through your keys and, you know, keys unlock doors. And so sometimes parts of our mind uh, need to be unlocked so we can see truth and from a different perspective. We need to seek God's truth. And Jesus said, the truth sets you free. So she read the keys and she got, then mm-hmm. I got this call. I just want you to know, um, uh, Audrey has decided not to have an abortion. Uh, mm-hmm. She will. And then what happened was uh, a, an aunt who was unmarried, but always wanted children. She was able to raise uh, Audrey and, um, mm-hmm. 10, 20, almost 20 years later, I was singing at a pro-life organization um, at, a, at a banquet. And um, there's a young woman who came up to me and she said, I just want to thank you for saving my life. And I said, well, I, I don't know about that, but um, I, I'm interested in your, in your words. Why do you say that? She said, mm-hmm. I'm Audrey's daughter. And here is this beautiful college student, just precious. And I, I, I will tell you, it it took me aback, meaning I was stunned uh, talking with her. And uh, I've kind of kept up a little bit with her life. And mm-hmm. she's a very uh, successful mother. And uh, she really makes a difference in mm-hmm. our world today. But she wouldn't be born. That's mm-hmm. why it's personal in that respect. Yeah. There is a second thing, though. My mother was not married and uh, had uh, four of us kids. I did not tell this for years. Um, and I remember mother telling me, I was advised to have an abortion Mm. and I went to my brother and I said, Ray, are you aware that mother was advised to have an abortion when you were in her womb? Mm -hmm. He said, no, I was not, I didn't know that. I, I never heard that. I said, well, I just want you to know that I'm so glad mother did not listen to that doctor Mm. that she chose to have you and he's a phenomenal business leader and um is very uh not only intelligent about the business world but also just the way he uses his life to Mm. help people in all kinds of situations and so I did not tell that for the longest time when I was going to I was asked to speak at Heartbeat International Mm -hmm. And it was it was the opening event, and the president at the time, she asked me to speak, and then, but I had never shared that before, and you know that's very personal because mm-hmm. it, it's painful when you grow up in a home. Uh, well, it was painful for us because I grew, actually grew up with a fictitious last name. It's very complex, and it was a bizarre family. Yet mm-hmm. I can say thank you. God that my mom chose to allow us to live and I've since told my two um, pro-choice sisters about this in regard to mom could have easily uh, Mm. taken the advice of a doctor and none of us would be a born would have been Mm. born so there are other extenuating circumstances that I typically don't tell, but since you asked personally why yeah. do I care about this, because it it, it it involves me personally, I could easily just not be here in existence. Mm. Well, thank God for your mom and her courage. Um, and, 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 you know, I think it's amazing that the testimony you shared of that impact of, of being willing to have a conversation uh, with someone who was considering abortion and and then years later meeting that human being uh, that productive member of our society um, that you know would not have been here otherwise you know I, I guess I would I want to 
go and ask you some questions, um, really touching on the counseling experience that, that you have. Um, and so I think the first question I have, and it's kind of a hard question, I'm going off script, I'm gonna have to warn you, uh, of the questions that I sent you in advance. But, you know, one of the things that we have seen, and we've really seen a rise in this in the past two years at Students for Life on campuses, uh, we're starting to see it in media interviews, especially with uh, Gen Z members, uh, members of this generation who are in college right now, and a little bit on the millennials as well. But, um, and I, I find it difficult to, to start these conversations where I'll be having a conversation with somebody about abortion, talking about the evils of abortion, the violence of abortion, and the person will reply to me. Whether they mean it or not, I don't know. I have to assume that they do. Um, but they will reply to me, well, I wish I were aborted. I wish my mother would have aborted me. So I think, uh, you, know, if, you know, if I were pregnant today, I certainly would want to abort my child. Or I think any woman who wants to abort a child should be able to because I don't want any child to be raised in a, in a situation that I was, you know, brought up in. And I th find it so hard because, you know, I have to stop talking about the baby or this this faceless child that they haven't met, a fictitious child that they haven't met, uh, and I need to talk about them because they're telling me something about themselves. How how do we as pro-lifers have that compassionate conversation with somebody who says, "Well, I wish I were aborted," therefore, you know, this is why I support abortion. Obviously, there's something uh, inside that has uh, not yet happened to that person because God intended us to value life. In fact, it's very significant. Um, the Bible says, I've set before you life and death. And then he says, choose life mm -hmm. so that you and your children may live. So obviously there are traumatic situations. And I'm going to admit if you talk to a number of people, they'll say, well, Christians are not compassionate. They don't think about, yeah. and we, we're called discompassionate. Now, that doesn't mean all people think that, nor is it true. Uh, I, I, it, what I like about your question is you're wanting to get beyond the words that, that let's say this is a woman, young woman, and she's looking at her situation. By the way, it depends on how old um, that person is. Many times I will say, are you aware that the brain does not fully develop until age 25 mm -hmm. to 28? And there are so many things that will happen emotionally. By the way, the emotional part of us, of the, of the mm -hmm. brain, develops much faster, but that rational cognitive, the, the prefrontal cortex, if you put your hand on your forehead, what's behind there is the prefrontal cortex. And that is what it takes the longest to develop. And many times what it requires for us as human beings is time to learn how to think in a way that's right in God's sight. And mm -hmm. since Jesus said that truth sets us free and that uh, we are transformed, the Bible says we're transformed by the renewing of the mind, sometimes the problem is we don't have the truth uh, light up, laid out for us. For example, I was talking with a 13-year-old boy who had written a suicide note at my home where we are right now, um, I have a home office here, and and um, bless his heart, he written this suicide note, and I I said to him, I just want to say, right now, whatever you're feeling, I know you're not liking life right now, and if you're like me, at one time you thought things will never change, because I mm -hmm. said that. Things will never change. I said it to myself. And I wasn't strongly verbal about life. Uh, it, my, my home life was painful and, and bizarre. And so 
I remember uh, I told him I I uh, had a, a, a plan <laughs> of how to end my life. And I thought, but what if I fail and now I'm a paraplegic because of what my plan was? And I thought, oh, I can't do that to my mom. Uh, my point is, life is a series of changes. Mm-hmm. And for us to understand that where we are at one point, it can be just incredibly different later. And that would be mm-hmm. true. In fact, I told this young man who wanted to end his life, I said, I want you to hear what God says. This is Jeremiah 29, 11. He says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I said, you don't know what the plan is. You can't know what the plan is. There's no way, but it's his plan and he knows how to affect the plan so that it comes into reality. So I said, I want you to take that scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11. I want you to read it when you get up in the morning and read it this way. Thank you, God, that you've said, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper Mm -hmm. you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Read Mm -hmm. it one time sometime during the day, and then before you go to bed, read it again and thank him that he has a plan that you don't know, but notice it's, mm-hmm. it's a good plan. So I really believe that the issue many times is that we haven't put in the God factor. And I didn't start out that way. I didn't, ha- I wasn't mm-hmm. in a biblically based church. I knew no Bible until I got around authentic Christians and then they clearly had something I did not have. But I think the issue is we then, we must present truth in a loving way, not a harsh way. And the Mm -hmm. fact that God has a plan, by the way, he has a plan for that little life, that little life. It's not just for Mm -hmm. you and for me, it's for every person he chooses to form. And I think that's another thing throughout. In fact, I was stunned when I started looking at the the scriptures that very clearly state that he forms us in the womb. It is true, by the way, the word abortion does not appear in the Bible, but there is so much that's said about um, pro-life, about God giving us life, and that's what we need to be locked into to see what what are the scriptures that are important. And I think it's uh, imperative that we realize we can't see the trajectory of, well, I'll ask you, right now, with what you are doing, did you ever think that God would have you doing what you're doing, impacting thousands and thousands of young people and adults. Did you ever think that that was God's plan for you? No. <laughs> and I probably would have planned differently had I known. I made different choices somewhere along the way. Yep. Yep. And that's logical. And so all the more do we say, Lord, I mean, for some reason I'm thinking about Noah, man in the Bible. He didn't <laughs> even know what rain was. He was told <laughs> to build an ark and he was jeered, made fun of. But he was faithful to God. And then Mm -hmm. for the first time, there was rain. So there are times when there are factors that we don't even know about, we've never thought about. And I think that's one of the fascinating things when we realize that when God has a plan, uh, there's a reason he uh, he has a plan. But one thing I want to say, Kristen, um, excuse me, um, I think it is vital that we have answers, for example, Mm. and we've seen all the placards, uh, my body, my choice. Uh, I understand that. I mean, I bet that that's a logical deduction, Mm -hmm. my body, my choice. Well, what I say is, yes, you do have the right over your body, but in pregnancy, 
there are two different bodies, two different hearts, <clears throat> two different brainwave patterns, two different genetic codes, that's DNA, often two different blood types, and two different sexes many times. So a woman mm -hmm. should have a right over her own life, um, but she should have, not have control of the death of another life. Pro-choice, okay. the pro-choice position overlooks the victim's right to choose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I thank you so much for this. This was very helpful. I, one more question for you, since I've got a counselor, a world-renowned counselor, a biblical counselor on, on the show. Um, how do you think um, we can exercise our empathy muscle? Uh, to can to ensure no woman stands alone who has suffering from post-abortive pain. What are your some of your I guess best advice in a couple of minutes? What's your best advice for those of us who serve in the pro-life movement to 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 exercise that muscle? You know, we always are drawn to people who are confused, who don't know how to think or don't know what to do. And if we can make a difference, <clears throat> well, we need to understand, okay, all of us have chosen wrong. And many times we're motivated. Mm -hmm. And this is what's fascinating. There are so many, I've, I've been on the board of, of several pro-life organizations, started out uh, the Downtown Pregnancy Center in Dallas and involved mm -hmm. for life. The, the, the bottom line is, you know who the most effective workers, we'll put it this way, though, there are those who have a heartbeat for themselves, a, a heart care for those who are facing and don't know what to do with those decisions, and some of the most wonderful workers are those who had an abortion because mm -hmm. they've rethought Many times what happens, and you know this, they think about their age right now. They think about how mm -hmm. old their little baby would be. Now, maybe right. it would be 18 years old, 20 years old. And many times, and, and so at our ministry, we have abortion recovery material that has helped many people. The bottom line is, Every, everyone has chosen wrong, every one of us. Well, the, the solution is to say, all right, Lord, how could I think, what should I have thought differently? Um, mm -hmm. And, and tr you know, what would happen if I had trusted God? Mm -hmm. uh, there are so many precious, I have a niece who now has adopted a little one. She's three years old now, just thrilled but my niece could not have a child, she and her husband. And so it, it, you talk about the blessing, and there are all these people who are waiting to adopt, praying for a, a little one. And so there are all different ways to be able to serve mm -hmm. those, but Sorry, the issue is compassion, it, and that, that is the right word. And and the, our God is a God of His of compassion. In fact, the Bible says His compassions never fail; they are new every morning. Mm. So, um, what we know is God stretches our capacity for compassion when we have trials, when we have chosen mm. wrong. Then we literally are in the best position to be able to make a difference in the lives of others. Amen. Thank you, June, for coming on today. Thank you for your ministry in Dallas and across the world, your, um, you know, your radio show, which I know serves uh, so many people, all the listeners who tune in every week. Uh, thank you for, for, for your wisdom and sharing that with us. I appreciate your time and I uh, can't wait to keep learning from you. And, you know, thank you to all of you who've tuned in today to this podcast. Um, I certainly was taking some notes. I hope you all were as well. Um, and maybe 
maybe you come back and might have to re listen or watch this episode um, because there's a lot of nuggets of wisdom in there. Um, I hope you will share this episode with family and friends. Um, those are pro-life and not pro-life yet. Uh, and make sure you certainly subscribe to uh, the Explicitly Pro-Life Podcast. Till next time, pro-life Jen. See ya. Thank you.